From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, Stephen Dorff. With Gina Grad on news, Bald Brian on sound effects, and we'll play a round of Sling It Forward. And now, he doesn't think dead people voted, but if his dad cast a ballot, that's pretty damn close. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. No choice but to get on your mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grad? That's right. Handball, Brian. Hey, hey, hey. Funny, I just wrote down moments before uh, Dawson spoke, I wrote down the word dad on mm. this uh, pad because uh, we're going to get in some uh, psychological calls today. And uh, I'll explain more about that in a couple of few. Um, we have uh, Max Pat had dug up some more 1780s guy. Sweet. <clears throat> ah, they're so bite size, and uh, you never really know which direction they're going. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Oprah, No Child Left Behind, and uh, Gay in the Military. Oh. Uh, those are our, our subjects for uh, 1780s guy. So uh, in any particular order, uh, Max Zapata. And where we put these up? On the YouTube page? Yeah, they're they're on YouTube. We'll put them up on our Instagram, too, if you follow Instagram.com slash Adam Carolla. All right, so the first one is, well, here it is. And now, Adam explains to 1780s guy, Oprah. So this Nubian sorceress now rules over this country? Can no man stop her? Well, we, I, no. That was Adam Explains <laughs> Oprah to 1780s Sorceress. Guy. <laughs> and uh, so that was Oprah. I think we did two Oprahs. Yeah, we played a, another one. We played before. the other Oprah. about breeding her or something, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the other one. And uh, this is uh, No Child Left Behind. And now, Adam explains to 1780s guy, no child left behind. Even the imbeciles? <laughs> well, they, they. That was Adam explains <laughs> no child left behind to 1780s guy. And uh, uh, last but not least, I think we have a <laughs> gay. That guy was a great actor, right? We yeah, have such cutting follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, well, remember the joke is I can't say, it. I can right. do no explaining. Uh, and then uh, gays in the military. And now Adam explains to 1780s guy, gays in the military. That was Adam Explains Gays in the Military to 1780s uh. Guy. Yeah, we got to bring that uh, We got to bring that back. I think I'm doing some more uh, Slippery Slope Guy because uh, people, people seem to like that. and they're, It's time. It's time. And, uh, you know, they're 35 seconds. I told Sonny to start writing down some ideas. Uh, all right. So um, Phil... My dog, Phil, had to go to the vet and stay the night in the vet oh last God, night. Oh, God, how many socks did he eat? I don't know what he ate, but uh, there was a combination of, it was a combination between kids, Grubhub, uh, Phil, and Phil's range. You know, when Phil gets mm -hmm. back up on his haunches, he can get the stuff about four foot off the ground. And uh, I think got hold of some pizza or something like that. So uh, he just, uh, he did that. Also, uh, I gave him, a, remember I told you I got that really crappy calamari? Yeah. yeah. You know how Delicious. I don't, you know, I don't like to throw things away. Correct. Well, that's dog food, man. <laughs> yeah. So Phil got a little calamari as well, but uh, I think that was just a uh, result in a little diarrhea. But uh, either way, Phil's back. He's got a shaved uh, IV paw thing. Oh, and uh, and uh, he's just moping. God, I around hope he's hydrated. Yes, he we will should be hydrate now. him. 
All right. So I don't know. I had a couple of weeks ago, we we're taking some calls and we we're taking a, maybe we we're doing Mr. Brightside or something, but we took a turn for the psychological and uh, it's always something. Uh, and uh, Ravi Patel was talking to me about people seem to like the psychological stuff and I do yeah. as well. And I realize that um, in terms of things you get from your parents or uh, things, abilities or what have you that may be passed down, uh, an interest and an ability in psychology is something that was always passed down to me by my dad. Now, my dad didn't really practice what he preached at home, (laughs) but he still liked you know, he would be a good contractor with the shittiest house on the block. You know what I mean? But he'd still be good to come into your home and do stuff. Hi, guys. Hi, guy. <laughs> um, yes, I saw you guys wanted to talk about psychology. So I um, I have my MFT. I'm not licensed, but I was a, um, okay. I got my master's okay. degree in that. So Hello? I actually worked as a therapist for a little bit while, while I was in grad school. Hold on a second, um, Bill. Uh, Brian and Gene are back. We're talking to Bill with his uh, master's in psychology from Sacramento, age 40. Got it. Bill, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I had some, some comments about it. I mean, I, I, I like psych- psychology too, but I do feel that, like, there's an overemphasis on, on um, therapy, should we say? I think there's, like, people, I think people think, oh, you hear this a lot. Oh, just go to therapy and you'll fix things. And it's kind of like, well, in one of my, some of my experiences, I was, when I was working as a therapist, it would be a lot of like, it was free therapy, by the way. And it was uh, like court ordered stuff. So people are there just, just trying yeah. to fill out a, some type of well, form or something. First things first, you should have a little skin in the game. If you're going to therapy, you should be paying for it all of it or some of it or something, the free stuff. It just, people don't utilize it. They don't appreciate it. I always use the example of a premiere to a free movie. You start slowing down about 40 minutes and you just leave because you didn't buy the ticket. You didn't make, you didn't make the effort. So that's number one. Number two, as far as therapist goes, a therapist is kind of like, in a weird way, it's kind of like having a personal trainer, except for you don't really need to work out when you're with the personal trainer. And the, the thing about the personal trainer is you can't just show up for your session on Thursdays and Saturdays for an hour and sit there and kind of grab a five pound weight and a donut and do nothing. But there's a version of that with therapists. Like you can sit there and kind of do nothing. You can lie to them. You can not work on things you want to work on. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a good therapist, and also there's a lot of bad therapists, but a good therapist will help you not get away with that, but it's not cut and dried. Like I said, you, you go to a trainer and you kind of do nothing. Your trainer's going to go, what the fuck? You got to do something. It's, it's so easily quantifiable. You know, there's a version of going to a therapist where you just kind of sit there and do nothing. And then you check the box. You go, I'm going to a therapist yep. and you don't, Feels good. you don't get anything done feels yeah. good in that you get to tell your spouse yeah. or your neighbor or whoever, hey, I'm in therapy. But there's there's a very lazy version of, of therapy. I think we've all, anyone who's gone to a therapist has had those sessions where you sort of sat there and you didn't really talk about that much. And you're just like, ah, fuck it. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to cry. We're just gonna, we're just gonna gloss <laughs> over. We're just well, gonna and like you, chit chat, yeah. And like you said about having skin in the game, a lot of times when you're going just to sort of stonewall and run out the clock, it's to get somebody else off your back, whether right. it's the county or your wife. Yeah. So you seeing people who were ordered by the courts to see you that that seems like it was um, it's doomed to fail. You know, on the launch, yeah, one, on the launch pad. You know, and the other part about it is, and to your comment that there's, you know, too many people or too many people are using it as a crutch or whatever it is. Yeah, I think, you know, much like the physical therapist, you have to do it 
when you're in front of them and then you have to have your homework. Like you, you have to go back home and you got to diet and you got to do your push ups and you got to do whatever that thing, whatever that thing you need to do. Because if you think about the therapist, I don't know, uh, how many, how many hours are there in a week? It's, uh, four times 20, like 150 hours in a week or something somewhere in that that neighborhood 168 168 all right so if you're going for an hour a week and there's 168 hours in a week then you got 167 hours to work on that shit and if you're not going to do any of that then that's a very small percentage that you're actually doing it gina you're not yeah that's so funny that just reminded me of um amy schumer had like her personal trainer on or something at some point in her podcast and and he said like the most the most important you know trick thing that i do to amy and to tell amy is walk walk everywhere walk early walk often walk all the time why because if we're meeting once or twice a week that's two hours So what are you doing? Like you said, what are you doing with 164 more hours of your week? You've got to be walking. And that's the same thing with therapy. Agreed. I, uh, so Bill. Yeah. So what what are you doing now with your master's in psychology? Uh, I'm a contractor now. So I gave it up. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, like I, I, I got in, so that was part of the, when when I got into it, I'm doing, and this was part of the, the, the program. Um, I'm, I'm doing therapy and, and I could just tell like, I'm not, I, I didn't help one person at all. And, um, uh, but then, you know, it was just kind of personal choices. I went out and I wanted to kind of actually make money and everything. So, um, it's, it's, uh, it, I just saw a much longer road down there, mm-hmm. um, to, to get what I did in my life. Well, you know, Bill, I think you can still use these skills in the contracting world because, uh, you know, when the homeowner, like when the woman is like, I said crown molding, not cove molding, did you? Or is that your mother speaking? Huh? You have to disarm her. I would be upset, too, if I got the wrong uh, crown molding. You have every right to feel upset (laughs) about having crown versus cove. But, uh, you know, your mother was a big crown fan. And um, I know you have feelings about her. I know she's been in the ground for several years, but uh, you're trying to live vicariously through her with your cove molding. So, Bill, what kind of contracting do you do? Well, um, so uh, we started a, like, when the, the banks hit um, uh, in 2008, we started a, like, a bank rehab business. And mm-hmm. then, uh, then that... Uh, um, fostered into some like developments and stuff like that. So you're doing uh, your flip. Are you flipping places? Well, no, no. So we, so originally we would hire, we we're hired by the banks to contract out to fix the places up oh, uh, right. for bank zone, mm-hmm. bank zone stuff. And then uh, we formed other businesses and then we, uh, we built apartment complexes and, uh, and houses and things like that. It's development developers and, and contractors. How do you guys, uh, uh, two questions. A, how do you account for this huge chasm between members of our society who are very interested in the psychological dynamic and those who have seemingly no interest in any of it, what makes them tick, their wife tick, their husband tick, any of it? And then who's happier? Because I'm, I'm starting to think that, you know, look, the happiest person in my house is Phil. I mean, sure, he had a rough patch last night, but I mean, <laughs> Phil's happy. Phil's happy. He knows nothing of psychology. He's he's all it. You know what I'm saying? He wakes up yeah. every morning. Every morning, uh, Sonny opens his door about 730 in the morning, and I'm always kind of surprised. And Phil comes chugging down the hall with his tail wagging. It's it's like he's never seen you before. You know, this is a, it's a brand new day. Every Every day. And then we all know people that are, you know, deep into uh, with their analysts and they're they're seeing them three days a week and they're but maybe that becomes a form of narcissism where it's just so much about you. There's so you're thinking so much about you all the time that you sit in front of someone three times a week and just discuss you. You're up in your own head at least. Yes. The only the only counterpoint to that I can think of is if somebody had no interest in psychology and just walked around the world going, nothing ever 
goes my way and everyone's against me and it's everybody else. Well, because they they lack yeah. the self-awareness that therapy might bring them, that it's, it's not everybody else. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But otherwise, I'll tell you, I'll switch places with Phil any day. Yeah. Well, the- that's funny because that reminds me of one of my favorite Simpsons episodes. Now, it sounds silly, but there, there's some truth here. The only episode to ever be cry, by the way. The one where Homer uh, has the uh, the crayon extracted from his nose mm-hmm. and he becomes a genius. Right. And like he becomes miserable the more he knows, like the more he understands about the world. And he has the, he has the crayon reinserted to become a dummy again. Um, kind of like uh, Flowers for Algernon, basically, yeah. kind of take off on that. Like, the more Wait, he Maggie, knows, the more miserable he is. Well, think Maggie's ab- first word didn't make you cry? Think no. about, uh, what'd she say, Homer? Daddy. Homer was the one. Oh, yeah, she said daddy. It think, was, Liz, fun fact, Liz Taylor voiced, I you know. Know, voiced uh, Maggie. Well, yeah. obviously, you, you think about how miserable the people are, you know, the Greta Thunbergs and everything of the world who mm-hmm. are just feeling the weight of, you know, if you think about, I guess, I guess the, well, here's an interesting thought. If you go too far in with your thinking and it's all about you and it's all about therapy and it's all about your problems, it's all about uh, what you need to fix, then you're going to be miserable. Uh, If you go too macro and you're just totally into global warming and what's going Mm -hmm. on in Sudan and the the indigenous people, that's a form of misery as well. I think there's some sort of intermittent or intermediate – sort of balance of thinking about yourself X amount, thinking about the globe X amount, thinking about your family X you amount. Know, yes. You know what a good example of that is mm. from from your own mouth are people who you say like certain protesters or Antifa or whatever all have daddy issues. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, oh, problems yes. with authority. Well, that's that might be a good time to hang out for a hot second and look inward. Well, it kind of makes sense if you think about the American family and you think about the kind of erosion of the American family and you think about, you know, absentee dads, you're going to have a large populace of people who have dad issues. And when you have, when you have dad issues, then the man becomes dad and then you lash out against the man. So it could be the president, it could be anyone wearing a badge. It could be any figure. Yes. Anyone in charge, an authority figure. Right. So there's going to be more and more lashing out, uh, against the authority figures. Um, page 33, Chicago had bad anxiety and depression. And then what page? And then I started a gratitude journal, and it has changed my life. And how does that work, the gratitude journal? So when I, whenever I have a day that I notice that anxiety might be creeping up on me, I keep a gratitude journal in my nightstand next to my bed, and I just start writing down all these things that I'm grateful for. It could be something really stupid, like, I'm so happy and grateful that my coffee machine works today. Mm-hmm. Um but it, it makes you pick out the littlest things in your life that can bring happiness to you um, instead of just thinking about how shitty the world is right now and complaining about everything. And it turned my life around. Well, you know, it made me think, and interestingly enough, um, focusing on the one stupid thing, like your coffee machine, right? right. So when <clears throat> I've always told you guys, if you want to balance or like you want to ride a unicycle or something like that, or you want to stand on a yoga ball. If you want to stand on a yoga ball, the only way to stand on a yoga ball, and it's the only way I can stand on it, and I imagine everyone is this way, you must pick a spot on the wall. You have to pick something, and you have to stare at that something solely, and you have to focus all your... all of your concentration on, on a spot, and then you can get up on the yoga ball. Mm-hmm. If somebody waved their hand in front of that thing you're staring at, you will fall off. If you look around, you will fall off. So it's like you you pick this spot, you focus on it, and you find your balance. And in a weird way, the, the coffee machine is sort of that way. Like you're mm-hmm. feeling anxious or you're out of control or whatever, and then all of a sudden you just suck it in to this coffee machine or whatever you feel grateful for could be anything. And then you find your balance. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. I agree a hundred percent. 
I do uh, also, uh, speaking of balance, I've been kind of guilty of it uh, lately because I haven't been up on the, the double-sided board or whatever it is, but physically do physical balance things. Balance. Get on mm-hmm. stuff. Get your balance. It, 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 they talk about, you know, you, you talk about getting on one of those, uh, one of those boards call I was right, the, uh, the balance boards, indo boards. Indo boards. Yeah, you get on one of those. If you think about getting on it's one like of those. It's like a skateboard with a, with a roll in the middle, right? With a cylinder in the middle of it, right. Think about the definition of that. So they always say walking is good because it's right, left, right, left kind of hemisphere, like gets your right side, then your left side. So walking almost always makes you feel better. But if you get on that indo board, then the the entire premise of that board is right left right left right left right. there's no right 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 if you go right twice you fall off you go left twice you fall off it's a constant shifting and so you just stand there and you pick that spot on the wall and you stare at that spot on the wall and meanwhile your body just goes into this back and this fourth right left hemisphere and uh you do that 5 minutes a day and uh it definitely evens you out Hey, Paige, uh, good on you for not uh, getting a bunch of drugs prescribed or, you know. I, for, I, I wouldn't let myself. The doctor was so quick to write me a prescription, and I said, no, I need to figure this out for myself. And I want to say one more thing. Hmm. Since I really started focusing on this this year, I can honestly say I have not had a bad day all year because I won't allow myself to. Yeah. Good for you. I, well, I give myself a little, like, five-minute, ten-minute break to have a bad moment and get over it, and then... I'm on to the next thing. The thing about uh, the thing about the drugs is obviously it's masking something. It's not curing something or getting something to go away. But also, I don't know. You you have to know. I mean, you do know you're on drugs. Like you know, every morning or evening or twice a day or whenever, when you take that pill, the act of taking that pill is you saying something's wrong with me. Right. Well, that's that's the same as taking a pill for a physical problem. Yeah, but the fi- it's also a physical problem if you're if you're not getting the uh, amount of norepinephrine that somebody else gets. I mean, just to cover all our bases. Yeah, I'm I'm saying like a physical problem. I would say you know if somebody had I don't know irritable bowel or or some something going on. I would say well let's change the diet. Let's start exercising. Let's start doing yoga or meditation or something. And then if that shit doesn't work, pardon the pun. And if you're still shitting your pants, right, then, we'll then, come we, back to then it. we can talk about getting you on something, which is obviously a real th- issue. But I mean, someone like Paige, it was too quick. They wanted to give her stuff. She mm-hmm. did it with a journal. Yes, Brian. I was saying, speaking of, Paige reminded me of something. And by the way, I love the gratitude journal. Christy does a version of that. That's great. Good for you, Paige. It reminded me, she mentioned the coffee maker, and I'm sitting next to my Keurig. And there's something awesome about looking at the world. Every once in a while, if you can manage to do it or remind yourself to do it, looking at the world through a child's eyes or like new eyes, like... The Keurig is amazing. Like you put a pod of coffee in there, press a button, and it makes a perfect cup of coffee. Like imagine what a pain in the ass coffee was 20, 100 years ago. And here we are like, oh, I got a pod of, I got a pod of coffee and I can myself make myself a perfect cup. Like we don't take enough time, I don't think, and I try to do it, but it's hard because it's just the things in your life that are there every day, every moment, you take for granted for good reason. They're there yeah. every day, every moment. But the, you got you to gotta remind yourself to recognize the amazingness in simple things. Oh, agreed. Uh, as I've said, and something's on, it's on my mind because I had a couple of people just recently, I had the CHP did some sort of auction and they auctioned off a, a tour of my car warehouse. And then uh, Paulette uh, Gergus actually hit me up the other day, wanted to know if she could, I've I actually had three people say, can I take a tour of your warehouse, and you guys know the story. They always go, oh, please, or thanks, or I know right. it's a hassle, and I always go, no, it's my favorite day. Because instead of just walking past everything or finding the problem or wanting to know what the fuck's going on, it's just people just going, this is so cool. Could you imagine working here or whatever? You get to come here every day, and I always end up going, yeah, it's yeah. Not bad. 
Yeah. yeah. Whether That's... it's a Keurig or several multi-million dollar <laughs> right. cars, take the time to appreciate. <laughs> take rich man, the poor time. Man. Yeah, or put the Keurig in the car there and really, <laughs> uh, really double down. Yeah, it's it's just um, it, it's it's a little bit of the version I always tell people of throw a party once a year so you'll clean your house. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It forces you to hang the pictures that have been leaning against the wall and t- you know wipe the stuff yeah. down. But uh, yeah, gratitude is everything, and it's so easy to skim past it and to blast right on to the to the next to the next problem because you know we are kind of like. You know, you think about how a cat is wired, you know, cats always kind of looking for movement, you know, like, oh, what's that over there? What's going on? Danger. The danger and movement. And you think about us, we're kind of that way with problems. You know, we're sort of head on a swivel, like what's broken, what's fucked up, what needs to be fixed. We're not really in appreciation mode. We're in the royal we. Mr. Hypervigilant. <laughs> I'm that. That's how I am. I'm I'm always into like what's broken and what needs well, to be brain, fixed. The brain is a problem solving organ, right? That's why you can't go to sleep sometimes when you're trying right. to fall asleep and all these problems rush into your head. Yeah. So uh, I'm to Christie's uh, gratitude um, log. How does that mm-hmm. work? I would be oh, way too lazy for that. It's kind of morphed into kind of a uh, Tessa memory. Like once Tessa started to become sentient, you know what I mean? It was all about her. So she writes down, and I'm really glad she does because now she has a fucking book full of handwritten notes about the things Tessa said or today she did this for the first time or, you know, the silly stuff. We're not going to, you know, celebrate it, but it's nice just to have it down to remember. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. May of last year was the first time she did so and so. And we're grateful for it. And Tessa, Christy will flip through every once in a while. Remember when she did this? My like, yeah, I do. Thank you for writing that down. Yeah. Well, I'm you start I've, now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. You, you, uh, we had some of that stuff for our kids and at some point you just run out of steam and you go, fuck it. <laughs> sure. But you also realize they are so well, um, God, I, I guess, uh, so well detailed. So so well captured. I mean, Sonny oh, yeah. has 15 oh, yes. buttons with his picture on it. What? Remember, it was a big deal to get your face on a button, like holding oh. a baseball bat, you know, in your Did baseball uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Just all I mean, that you're, shit. You're yeah. an outlier in this, but Gina, how many pictures existed of your sixth birthday? For me, it was like probably six or seven yeah. or five. No you know idea. I mean? Like there are a few pictures. Nowadays, yeah. it's almost captured start to finish. Whatever my dad could carry on his back, and by by that I mean the entire VCR <laughs> and film, and those, and who knows where those are. I'd like but to see your hair. Um, <laughs> the 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 thing that's funny but always reminded me of uh, when Brian was talking about the Keurig and what a hassle that was. Always the Corolla thing when we had dinner over at my grandparents' house. When my grandmother would go, "Does anyone want coffee?" And then everyone would sit there going, well, it's a lot of work. You know what I mean? And then her, <laughs> yes. I, I don't, that's one of the downtrodden, <laughs> one of the downtrodden um, gears or abilities or whatever you have to have is, and so anyone listening, please think about this. You know, the people that turn next to nothing into a fucking, uh, like like they're like they're having to build the Louvre or something yes. like like it's like it's a nothing. It's I don't want to go through the hassle, right? And so it's like so my grandma would always go, "Who wants coffee?" And then my stepdad would like sheepishly raise his hand, and then my grandmother would go, "Well, if John's the only one. I'm not going to make coffee, but we can do <laughs> we can do instant coffee." And uh, again, the instant coffee to me is up there with loading and unloading the dishwasher. The shit's in the sink. The hot water's running. You got the sponge out. Just, just do it. Do two, two more laps on that plate and put it on the dryer. Let it let it air dry on the rack. You're there. Like, you're right there. Yep. Now we're going to go. The, the, froze, the freeze-dried, you know, taster's choice with flavor crystals. crystals or whatever. <laughs> she, she would have to dig that shit out of the freezer. Then it, it was always spot welded to the jar. So now you got to fucking take a pick and go at it because you don't just scoop it out. You had to bang off. You had to knock off some shale. You know, you had to, you had to, you had to whack it with a fork eight times. Then she'd get this freezer burn fucking offering mm-hmm. together. And then she'd have to boil a 
kettle of water on the sink. You have to put a, a pot of water, sorry, on the stove and boil it, which always took longer. And then she'd put it into the cup. Work. And then she'd pour it in a cup. Then she'd stir it up. But it was just, it, it looked like the La Brea tar pits. Like the top just had chunks floating on it. Like it never fully got dissolved. There'd be some McDonald's wrappers and trash in there on the top of the mug. And then she'd hand it. And it sucked. So now it it took every bit as long as making coffee, but it but it sucked. The other thing I remember from when my grandparents would go out of town, I would feverishly dig through the freezer and at some point inevitably find a coffee cake that had been frozen for eleven years in there. But yeah. I could bring it back to life. Like that was still it was like oh sweets, God. sweets for free. All right, let's talk to uh, Bernie. Bernie, Riverside, 21. Hi. Hi, guy. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hey, have I talked to you before? Yeah. Did we talk about your smoke detector? Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Smoke Sound- Bernie. It's been replaced. Yeah, we had the we had the thing. Yeah, because uh, the, the, the chime was chirping. <laughs> You wanted to replace it. And your mom said she didn't want to. Uh, she didn't want to spring for a nine volt battery. Yeah. Was that was that your story? Yeah. All right. Listen, everyone. Don't tell me what you said and then what I said. I have people all day going. I. You said no. You said, but then then I said, and then you said. This call's three years old, right? Yeah. All right. I remember the story. You were also yeah. part of a school group for, uh, like, young lesbians, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. No, yeah. Adam, you said, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then I said, blah, blah. By the way, that's two days old. People try to pull that shit on me. <laughs> when I'm in the room with them. All right. Sorry, uh, young Bernie. So how's the, uh, how's the Young Dykes of America going? Or what? how's the group going? That's what it's called. I think it uh, was. It's Tyke Dykes. Tyke Dykes. Uh, I'm no longer a part of it, unfortunately. Oh. It, it it cut into my school schedule, and I uh, I had to drop it, unfortunately. You can, you uh, always make time for breakfast and lesbians. Those are the two things my <laughs> grandmother told me. I'm also having a recollection about your hair being a odd color, like blue or pink or something. I don't think I ever brought that up, but it is. What are you? So are we doing the psychic hour? <laughs> you do have blue. And Bernie, and Bernie, if I off. can get in on, if I can get in on the fun, it wasn't it because you were you're bi and you were afraid to tell your mom, right? No, uh, she knew, oh. but she didn't like me being a part of the the club. Right. Okay. So do you have blue hair? I right now I have half pink, half black hair. Oh, okay. It's it's split down the middle. Conservative, uh, Adam. She's in yeah. the job market. I had some <laughs> recollection of hair, but maybe it was an outfit you were making or something like that. I seem to recall you making uh, an outfit. Uh, I make cosplays. I, I do oh. costumes for conventions and stuff. But that Adam, you said noon. <laughs> you didn't say one o'clock. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, All right, Bernie. I know way too fucking much about you. <laughs> Tell us so more. Strange. Why don't you tell me about me? What do you recall from me from our <laughs> conversation from three years ago? Uh, I remember you called my mom a bitch because she didn't want to change the smoke detector. Yeah. Yeah. She probably thought Sounds that about- battery was going in a vibrator now that I think about it. But, uh, yeah. What uh, What else? Um, God, I don't remember. It's so strange that you remember this much about me and I can't remember anything. Well, if I had read it about you, I would have no recollection of it because, but because mm-hmm. it was verbalized, because you you told me, then I have a because I heard it. That's why I have a recollection of it. Um, all right, Bernie. So what's uh what's going on with you right now? Uh, well, I I have some experiences with you know psychological problems. Uh, I've been hospitalized about seven times mm. now since I was thirteen. For suicide Jesus. attempts? Annually? Not annually. Uh, not for 
well, I have one suicide attempt, a real suicide attempt, where I did actually try with the noose. But uh, the rest were kind of uh, suicidal ideation, where I told my therapist, like, hey, I'm not feeling, you know, super good about life right now. I might go home and, you know, but uh, she said, okay, well, let's send you somewhere where you can sort of chill out for a couple of days Mm. until you feel better. And then you can get, like, medication, but it's, like, reworking your medication or talking to someone about, you know, what's going on in your life so it doesn't feel super stressed out. Let's talk about you for a second. By the way, I've had that. I mean, I didn't tell my therapist I'm thinking about killing myself, but I have had several therapists announce they were thinking about killing themselves after (laughs) I was complaining about my dad for 40 minutes. Um, So here's an interesting thought that nobody will embrace in this uh, new woke uh, culture we're living in, but uh, the older I get, the more I realize there's a kind of act as if, you know what I mean? There's a don't have two-tone hair. You know what I mean? Try to, try not, try not to identify yourself as troubled or broken or, you know, um, or, or, or or haunted or misunderstood. Like what, why, what about a little acting as if, what about, uh, you know, we, uh, we get that hair to be the same color on the right hemisphere as we do on the left hemisphere. And, and all the stuff you're doing, which is kind of you know, a form of acting out and, and kind of an identification thing. What about what about being boring? What about uh, getting a job? What about having the same color hair? What what about it? Uh, in all honesty, the reason I dyed my hair half pink, half black was because of a comic book character. I like it wasn't really acting out. I was like, oh, I really like Harley Quinn. Maybe I should dye my hair like her. Right, but I like Le- I like LeBron James, but you don't <laughs> you don't see me with the Amish beard. That's Ki- that's Kimmel's territory. But what I'm saying is, is I like Michael Jordan. Yeah, there's stuff you like, but that doesn't mean you have to become that thing. You know, you got the cosplay stuff. Like, how about a little more you and a little less Harley Quinn and cosplay stuff? And you know what I'm saying, Bernie. I, I get it, but I don't know. It's, that's never really been, it, it, it's not really me. I mean, I, I like my hair the way it looks because of Harley Quinn. I like making costumes and going to conventions and talking to dudes who are, you know, dressed like Batman. It's just, but it's don't, don't, you, uh, don't you guys think or worry that some people much like, I don't like, I don't like, I don't like the idea of sitting around and playing a video game for too many hours a day because you were just become this thing. You're not, this isn't your life. This is a synthesized digital life that you've entered. You know, like I see all these commercials for like Star Wars goggles and stuff and you put the goggles on all of a sudden you're at the bar and Star Wars and stuff. And I thought, A, no thank you. B, that's what booze is for. And But C, it's like, what are you saying about your life when you want to enter another make-believe world? Constantly? Says the guy who surrounded himself with Paul Newman cars. That's a, <laughs> I got to look at Chris so we can remember to make fun of you about that after this. All right. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. That has nothing no, to do you, with we this. We made that joke in the past about the, uh, the video games or the card, but she's doing something tactile. She's making costumes. She's going out and socializing. You know what I mean? It's not stuck in your bedroom playing the video game. That's uh, At least this is. there's some social outlet there, a creative outlet. I like it, but there's two things. I'll pass it. I'll just pass. I can pass everything through this filter. Would you want your daughter getting into this? And if not, why not? Um, probably not. Only be- I don't know. I feel like there's a I don't know, Bernie. Do you get I, depending on the people you hang out with or not? Like, is this something you get made fun of for or or teased? Not made fun of, teased about, or is there some sort of like bullying going on? Like that. That's the main reason I probably wouldn't want Tessa to get in on it, just because it's I don't know. It it feels like ripe for bullying. See, honestly, no. Uh, no, because I remember high school during uh, there was some like costume week that we did for high school, and I went dressed as Eleven from Stranger Things. I had the dress and the blonde wig, and it was mostly people coming up to me like, "Hey, like, where'd you get this?" And I was like, "No, I made it." 
But see, to me, it smacks of something a little deeper. It's not just the potential of being bullied. It says, I want to live in a world or part time in a world that's not really that's an escape from my world, a sort of fantasy world. Like, I think you would say that about anyone that was too steeped in anything, you know, too involved with Internet porn or whatever yeah, yeah. it is like. Or, or how about gambling? You know, what I mean, just the yeah. people that are into this thing. It's not necessarily that the act of it is destructive. It's that you're attracted to it. I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. So, Bernie, what I'm saying is, is a little less emulating Harley Quinn and a little more uh, getting back to Bernie. <laughs> Could we get back to Bernie or like find out who Bernie is? Uh, all I know about Bernie is Bernie's a giant nerd. <laughs> All right, so then be a fucking nerd. The, the, nerds well, by the cool way, the now. nerds have taken over the planet. Yeah. yeah. You want to be a multi-billionaire, be a nerd. The five richest people on the, <laughs> the United States are all nerds. I mean, literally. <laughs> Just embrace your nerddom then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but hang on to those uh, sewing skills. I could see Bernie doing, you know, major, uh, you know, like uh, for, for movies and stuff. Like, don't don't let go of that skill. That seems to be something you're good at and that you like to do. I like that part of it. But make yeah. the goofy outfits and give them to underprivileged inner city kids <laughs> so they can do the cosplay. <laughs> Last but not least. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go before, ahead, Gina. For you, Adam, because mm. uh, I'm curious about this. Um, because, you know, a lot of stuff that we talk about in the show, I take into my personal life and I recount to other people. And so, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding. So when we're talking about medicine masking, Mm -hmm. If, say, Bernie felt like she was the most who she is when she has, like, half pink hair. Let's just use that as an example. And we say, well, that's kind of not normal. That's whatever. Diet, you know, chestnut brown and fit in. Wouldn't that be another way of masking who she is, who she feels she is? I feel like Bernie is a shy person who wants attention with these sort of external Accoutrement. Accoutrements. And um, I feel, I don't, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your cool watch or your cool car or your cool home or, or whatever you think is whatever you've done. But I do feel like Bernie isn't Bernie or doesn't know Bernie. I feel like she's trying to be somebody else because she doesn't feel comfortable being Bernie. And she's uh, grafting on other things that she likes to piecemeal a person together, a personality. Yeah, she's she's kind of doing that. That's that's what it feels like to me. And it, well, whatever it is, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's working because three years ago she was having problems and she's I still feel like she's having problems. So try to hang herself, for God's sake. Yeah, I would say that's an indicator of a possible problem. So. I'm 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 kind of in a weird way saying what you're saying, maybe in a reverse way, which is uh, try to get comfortable in your own skin. You know, um, mm -hmm. see, see, I mean, ultimately, if you're not comfortable in your own skin um, and I know there's people that just dye their hair pink and go, this is who I am. But do you have to go down to the. You have to go down to the store and get pink dye and put it in your hair so that you can discover who you are. Mm. I mean, We're not all Betsy Johnson. Feel, not everyone could pull that off. I feel like uh, that's you letting other people think you're something. That's all. And it, it'll be a better life. Also, I, I sort of have, look, I yelled at my son for getting too much into Pokemon. Like, <laughs> I'm like, look. Let's go down the road 10 years. Are you still going to be into this or are you going to be embarrassed to see those old pictures of you? And if that's the answer, then maybe uh, nip in the bud. Bill, last call, 65 Indianapolis. Hey, Adam. Thanks. I had a chance to meet you when I watched the Willie T. Ribs doc here a couple of years ago when you were in town. Oh, uh, good. Thanks. Really, really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a business coach, and thank you for doing this episode. I think a lot of people are really interested in this because of the struggle that this year has been. And uh, I actually did a podcast on my own the other day on just being adrift. You know, how, sometimes we just wake up and we're kind of adrift in life, like your previous caller maybe. And every business problem that people come to me with seems to have some underlying theme of either a lack of self-respect, a lack of self-acceptance, like you just said to her, 
uh, a lack of self-love. And I know that sounds really squishy, but deep down, that's all we struggle with. This psychology topic is awesome because we're afraid. I think we're afraid of, of digging down deep inside of us. And so as a business coach, I just hear that all the time. Goals can't be accomplished because we, I've never really looked at myself deep down. Well, you know, I am, like I said, the older I get, uh, Bill, I'm just becoming a, a big fan of a fan of act as if, you know, when people ask you how you're doing, don't say, okay, say I'm doing great. You know, when you see your kids in the morning or whomever in the morning, have some energy that, uh, fake it till you make it thing. You don't have to fake it that long. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty immediate. I mean, you start saying substituting, I'm doing fine or, uh, I've been better or I'm doing okay with, I'm doing great. Say that five times a day and see if you don't feel like you're feeling great or doing great. Prophecy. Yeah, it's just, it's all kind of, it's all kind of in the, you know, grandma knew best, you know, get out, sweat, have a project, get engaged, get a community, get involved with stuff, have, have, have things for your mind. You know, the, the thing, the reason I always want everyone to go start a project, it could be Gina in the kitchen or it could be me in the garage is it, it's engaging. Like you don't really have time to pout or think about yourself or wonder, burn your souffle. wonder about all the hungry kids in, in, in the world. You're just kind of, I got to get this and I got to make a list. Like literally the act of making a list makes you saner just having a here's what i need and i have this project and here's what i'm missing and i'm gonna do and your and, mind's not as all over the place scattered and you start like you'll you'll have these revelations like you'll wake up in the morning yep. and you'll go oh fuck we're gonna do oh no i'm doing it this way i'm not yep. gonna do it that way i got a better way of doing it and if you can get a community of people that are like-minded, then they start talking and you start talking. And the next thing you know, you're on to better ideas or better techniques or better ways to do it. It's just a, a sharing. So uh, act as if everybody. All right. Uh, let's see. I got uh, simply safe here. Who knew that would take a turn, man. <laughs> Simply Safe break-ins on the rise during the holidays. So Simply Safe's having a huge holiday sale, 50% off any system and free security camera as well. Whether you're traveling or staying put for the holidays, check out the 50% off plus free security camera deal. Uh, it's going to end this week. So let's get going. We use Simply Safe here. We've always used Simply Safe. Peel and stick, batteries last up to 10 years, no drilling. No crawling around. Nobody in your house. You do it yourself. U.S. News and World Report called it best home security of 2020. It's an arsenal of sensors and cameras. Set up yourself. Takes about 30 minutes. And uh, their specialist monitor uh, you around the clock. They'll send emergency uh, send help if there's an emergency. That is Simply Safe, right, Dawson? Get up to 50% off Simply Safe plus a free security camera today by visiting simplysafe.com slash Adam. Go today, this week, this deal is this week only. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. Simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right, we'll take a, a quick break and then we'll get into uh, our game right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, I'm here to tell you that real men still exist. I smoke while I lift thousand pound sheets of steel with suction cups. And I like anchovies and onions on my pizza. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. I want to make out with this dude. <laughs> right after the weird. anchovy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to uh, we're going to play the uh, Sling It Forward game. Sh by the way, to uh, show you all the great viewing options you have on Sling TV, we're going to play Sling It Forward. And Dawson, give us some of the movie descriptions, and then we'll uh, compete and uh, guess the uh, guess the movies and or TV shows. Or are we just on movies? Movies. That's always movies, right? All right. It's time to play Sling It Forward, the game that's suspiciously familiar. Brought to you by Sling TV. Oh, we found a sponsor. Here we go. 
A magazine writer makes promiscuity her credo. Pete. Gina. Pete. Sex in the oh. city. Huh. Gina. Oh. Right out of the gate, we got we got to go to the judges. Nah, Sex in the city. I think it's not. Yeah, but after think, her fall, no, Pete came no, wait, in first. No. Pete came first. Procedural question. They both <laughs> rang in, so I can just wait for the whole description, right? I guess, yeah. Yes, you can. Let the baby have his bottle. After her father <laughs> convinces her that monogamy isn't realistic. Oh, While writing a profile it. about a charming and successful sports doctor. Damn it. She finds herself actually falling in love. Oh, yeah. For the first time. Oh. Uh, this oh. is a train wreck. Oh, yeah. Got to buzz in with your name, Brian. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was DeFranco. Three losers. From 2015. Uh, Brian, tra- train wreck. It is train wreck. Oh, I'm so pissed. An AWOL U.S. soldier travels to Hong Kong to compete. Brian. Brian. Kickboxer. In a secret, ultra-violent martial arts competition. Oh, I got all the time in the world. <laughs> As he works to gain access to the underground fight scene, yeah. he must outmaneuver the military officers trying to track him down. I never saw this movie, but Pete, Bloodsport. From 1988, yes. it is Bloodsport. Everyone says uh, that's yeah. a good movie, but that's is it? That's what I meant. It's wonderfully cheesy. All right. This is with the giant Asian guy at the end, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A telesales operative becomes disillusioned with his existence mm. and begins to hunger for fresh excitement in his life. As he, yeah. I heard Brian. This is uh, Joe versus the volcano? As he experiences a Pete. new awakening. Pete. Pete. Gina. One of seven Jim Carrey possible movies. <laughs> of the senses... His wife and daughter also undergo changes that seriously affect their family. Gina. Gina. Pardon the interruption? No. From 1999, that is the description of American Beauty. Oh, it really? Is? Wow. Okay. No, I'm lying to you. <laughs> An FBI agent must go undercover. Pete. Pete. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, oh, shit. Then, oh, Gina. <laughs> all right. I'm going to say, um, what the fuck was that Keanu Reeves movie? <laughs> I can't even think of the name of it. All right. I'm out. Go ahead, Brian. Adam, I should split this one. Point break? Duh. To investigate wow. the location of a lethal biological weapon planted by his arch rival. After undergoing a Pete, Pete, you're out. No, keep talking, Dawson. After undergoing a radical surgical procedure, he takes. He got circumcised, Gina. If that's hell. (laughs) I don't want to give you any Um, more than that. Uh, uh, uh. I hate all these movies. It's Face Off from 1997. It is Face Off. Weren't you home last Saturday? And if so, why weren't you watching Face Off? Because I know, it was on. I have no excuse. You had a lot to correct. <laughs> His overprotective mother has always relegated him to the sidelines. Gina. Brian. Gina. Shit. Water Boy? Yeah. From 1998. Mm, wow. It is the Water Boy. Good call. Gina's good Damn, at this. I was game. just watching some clips from Water Boy. <laughs> Three I'm ambitious. Three ambitious, strong women. Known for their presence on one of America's most powerful news networks. Gina. Gina. Oh, what the fuck is the Fox movie called? Um, Oh, hell. Brian, Brian. The spooky, hold on, the spooky Megan (laughs) Kelly. It was called, um. I'm with you, I can't think of the name either. Pretty Little Big Liars. Gina and I should split this one. It's bombshell. <laughs> bombshell. There will be no split from 2019. Oh, no. Oh, is it it is bombshell. bombshell. Mm. It's not, it's not. After getting transferred for evaluation from a prison farm to a mental institution, <laughs> he assumes it will be a less restrictive environment. Brian. Brian. 
I'm going on a limb here. This is uh, five. Years. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Uh, the other Jack Nicholson movie, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, from 1975. Wow, yes. wow. good deep dig there. One of three movies to sweep the Oscars. Mm. What's, the the What's the score? What's the score, Max Zapata? Uh, Brian has three. Gina has two. Pete has one. <laughs> He's right. tracking down the man who raped and murdered his wife. The difficulty, however, of locating his wife's killer, Gina. Fugitive is compounded by the fact that he suffers from a Brian, rare Brian. Brian, 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 Brian. This is uh, the fantastic Christopher Nolan movie Memento from 2000. It is uh, Memento. Oh, wow, I never saw I this. Oh, oh you'd love it's Memento. Good. You should watch it with Sunny. That's a that's a sweet movie. It's Brian's stressful. one point away. A fairy tale adventure. Brian. Brian. <laughs> Princess Bride. For the win Whoa! from 1987, oh! The Princess Bride. You can't beat that. <laughs> Pretty good. You cannot beat that. You're the worst. <laughs> Sling It Forward, brought to you by Sling TV. Make the smart choice and switch to a Sling TV. Get the best cable for the best price. It's uh, easy to switch and save. Learn more at sling.com slash Adam. That is sling.com. Slash Adam. All right. Let's Adam see. Memento is really good. You, Sonny would dig it too. You guys should watch it. I, uh, oh, sorry. What? Johnny Weir was eliminated this week. Oh. Yeah. God oh. I, damn it. I found out the night of, but I didn't want to text you it because I figured you would, you would find out on your own. I don't want to be the bear bad news, but you haven't talked about it yet. So I, how I wasn't checking. How, uh, how many are left? Uh, I, there's only one round left, so I think there's only two couples left. Uh, two, it was a double yeah. elimination, and they, Johnny had the lowest score and lowest fan votes. So, oh, he had the lowest score and the lowest fan votes. Yeah. Well, that's true. He's not. He's probably not a fan favorite, but yeah, he wasn't a fan favorite. So, mm. that, and that, I guess that that's a lot of points. I'm about to have a double elimination. Brutal. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Oh. Nelly. Nelly went on. I think though. So. Nelly went on. Yeah, Nelly. And I what think oh, I think there's actually three couples. I know I know Nelly advanced, and then Caitlin Bristow, and um, oh, and there was one Neve. more. Nelly. Was, was AJ, oh, oh, the guy from Catfish, I think, went on. Neve. Oh yeah, oh, Neve. Neve. Yeah, Neve. yeah, Neve is surprisingly good. Caitlin is good. Oh man, oh, I've brutal. hit rock bottom, people. <laughs> uh, Stephen Dorff is uh, going to be uh, on in a second. So uh, let's see. What do we got here? Good movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, his new movie as well. And then we'll spend the rest of the time talking about Judgment Night because uh, he was in Judgment Night. And uh, that was the first time I was on a movie set as a stand in for one of the bad guys. But that was a big deal. That's back, by the way, that's back when f you had any job that had craft service, a snack table and or free lunch, you know, hot lunch and mm -hmm. dinner. That was just it was a de facto a good job. That didn't sure. really matter what the job was. It was like you get a hot meal. That You've was arrived. A, that was a big goddamn deal. All right. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with Stephen Dorff right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Stephen Dorff's Birthday Cocktail Party. For July 29th, let's see who's on the guest list. The guy who invented the safety pin and the sewing machine, Walter Hunt. Fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini is here. The murder victim from Los Angeles' notorious Black Dahlia case. Elizabeth Short, Charles Schwab, Peter Jennings, documentarian Ken Burns, fashion personality Tim Gunn, the greatest bass player to ever live, from the greatest band to ever play, from Rush, Getty Lee, Martina McBride, Quill Wheaton, and Dak Prescott. Stephen Dorff is on the Adam Carolla Show. Quite a roster, Stephen. Yeah. 
Uh, good to talk to you. The movie Embattled is available tomorrow in select theaters and on video on demand as well. Uh, nice job in the movie, Stephen. Oh, thanks, Adam. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, he must have had to train quite a bit to do all the uh, MMA stuff. Yeah, it was uh, it was kind of kind of intense. It was kind of a sh- cliff note version of what I would have liked to have done. But in the end, uh, I had a great team of guys um, that got got me through the MMA stuff pretty quickly. But I, I just finished uh, 110 or 105 day shoot on True Detective. So when I I only had about six weeks before Embattled started, and I was I knew that going in. But I, in retrospect, I would have liked to have had a little more time. But it was. It was cool, man. We made it happen. I think, and that would have been tough. And in, in True Detective, he ends up being what sixty-five or plus yeah, a senior cool. citizen. It would have been tough if he was all yoked during the uh, last couple episodes. <sighs> no, that was the thing. Was I knew I was, you know, I was coming into that, so I didn't know how to do that. I didn't want to start training when I'm wearing a big belly as an old man. Uh, but now we got. I mean, I had a great trainer. This guy Josh Perzo, Adam, out of Montreal, who's worked with me before and he's great and then i got down to alabama and i met chris Connolly, and uh who's the, an incredible trainer of ufc fighters and has a great stable of talent that he represents and works with and uh so they just uh, him and fernando chin and uh just kind of created some really incredible fights and we uh started learning them me and darren man was a really good canadian young actor plays with my son he is and um you know, I was kind of, we were talking about psychology before this and something stuck out in my head when you said, um, well, you didn't know if you had much time in between true detectives and this, but you just said, uh, let's do it. And that is a mentality that more people should have where you just go, well, it's going to be tough or it's going to be a lot of work or it's going to be a tight squeeze, but let's just do it. Like just, just because that's basically how life works. You know, nothing is ever perfect. I mean, nothing, there's never, I made an independent film and my uh, agent was uh, yelling at me, you start an independent film right when you're doing, uh, taking over for Howard Stern on morning radio. And I said, there's never a good time to do an independent film. There's never, I have six weeks of nothing to do and a $1.5 million to flush down the toilet. It's like, it's never, it's never a good time. There's never really a good time to do anything. So just sign up and, and throw, just go, yeah, just go for it. Card, see where the cards fall. I knew I had a great script because David McKenna is a, a friend of mine and a great writer. Uh, he wrote some of my, um, some of my favorite films, like, you know, Below with Johnny Depp and you know uh, he wrote American History X he, he wrote SWAT too but I really loved American History X and Below and um, I just read this script and I thought wow what an unlikable character beast of a character but you know what a challenge in its own sense so I thought you know and I, I liked uh, I loved the um, the way this this first time director Nick Sarskoff put it all together I mean he just used some great technicians and really made it more of a, it's more of a father son dysfunction drama than it is just a fight movie. But when we get into those fights, those fans, I think will, will see some stuff they haven't necessarily seen before in an MMA film. Cause there hasn't really been that many films based in MMA and the UFC and, and the whole sport has become, it just seems like it's the biggest sport in the world next to football or soccer in uh, in Europe. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of diminished boxing. Unless yeah. Tyson Fury's fighting, there's no, you know, we don't really talk about lightweight boxers anymore. I mean, at least I don't, I, I used to love boxing, but this whole MMA thing's kind of taken it to an extreme as our, kind of like our world, you know, it's like the more extreme the sport, the more extreme the well, fans and the pay-per-views and all the craziness that goes with it. Well, you know, if you really just sort of think about boxing, so when we were growing up, it was always like, well, who would win in a fight, a martial artist or Muhammad Ali, or who would win a wrestler or, you know, a, a weightlifter or bodybuilder or something like that. So yeah. b- boxing was just a way for us to decide who the baddest man in the land was. But once they opened it up to UFC and now you're using grappling and, and jujitsu and, and feet and everything, 
Well, yeah. now it's just a pure version of who's the baddest man in the land. And yeah. b- boxing is nice, but it doesn't really determine who the baddest man in the land is. And in, in literally, quite literally, the world. So, yeah. so the, the, Warriors, you know? the, the heavyweight champion of the UFC is basically the toughest guy on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and then, and guess what? They'll probably once there's a a heavyweight uh, in the UFC that creates a real, real momentum uh, as far as uh, you know a stardom like a Conor McGregor in the light and middle. I guarantee it. They'll offer Tyson Fury and him a fight. You know, at some point, you know, they'll offer a big heavyweight champion uh, to from boxing to come in and maybe join the cage or vice versa, the way Connor fought maybe, you know, well, it's all just yeah. one. It's, it's one basically, it's basically us saying, uh, you know, snicker snickers bars are good, but what if you deep fried them? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, that's good. Like everything is just an extreme version of what it, what it used to be. And yeah. maybe it's just because our pleasure centers are being burnt out or something that we now need to see this this insane extreme. I mean, if you think about think about the X Games, think about the shit they're doing on those skateboards when you see like the big air ramp and stuff. I mean, it is it makes evil Knievel look like Mrs. Doubtfire, like the shit 14 year olds are doing on a skateboard. Now when they drop in and do the big air and they just launch themselves 150 feet in the air, like it is insane what people are doing yeah. or the snowboarding world too, which goes with the whole skating world. But like Sean White's a, an old buddy of mine. And, and he, when he did that last run in the winter Olympics or, uh, you know, that, that perfect run and he won the gold again. I was just like, I mean, it's insane that the air that he's getting and some of these kids are getting it's uh, and you know, but I, yeah, I have a lot of respect for skateboarding and snowboarding and were you, you, I'm looking down here, speaking of shit you do when you're young, uh, you attended several private schools growing up and were expelled out of five of them. Yeah, that's always been like a little of an extreme in the press story. I, you know, I got, I my parents, where my mom was called and asked, they they basically just said, we'd love it if Stephen would go somewhere else. <laughs> they <laughs> allowed you to resign. They yeah, referred. They, I didn't like burn. A, I didn't burn the cat. You know, the the uh, the kitchen down, or you know, getting any fist fights. Really, I, I just I just didn't like the LA private school system. And I didn't really like, uh, the fact that I didn't have a teacher that really made me interested in, in wanting to learn, you know, she didn't really, I was a different kind of kid. I didn't really, you know, yeah, I was a Cub Scout. I, um, I did uh, little league and stuff, but I wasn't like the greatest athlete in the world. I was, seemed like I was a creative person and a jokester and somebody that just didn't want to be in the classroom in a uniform. That just, pissed me off you, so uh, you, you grew up in la yeah i grew up in LA since i was three months three months old i was a baby my parents uh met in an elevator in manhattan but my dad was going to college the university of georgia in athens my mom was staying with him and uh i was born in atlanta when i was uh when he was just graduating and then we moved to la and he was a uh, kind of a struggling songwriter sent there by a publisher and then Started writing some big old songs. Where where did you grow up in L.A.? My first uh, place was an apartment uh, when, when I was born. Uh, basically three months old, I lived uh, off Tahunga Avenue, where where that whole uh, Vitello's, Robert Blake yep. thing mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. That yeah. was my street. It was right behind the CBS, uh, MTM, the Mary Tyler Moore block yeah. there. Yeah. And then my dad, my dad wrote Every Which Way But Loose for the Clint Eastwood movie, which became a uh, number one in the world and then that song and so he uh i guess made some coin and i grew up my brother was born my little brother and then uh, a few years later and then I, we were going to these private schools you know because my dad was a becoming a big songwriter and uh and so uh yeah i, I you know I, I had some great schooling but i i think it i think it wasn't until i was about 17 or you know 15 and started working. I was on Roseanne and I was doing 
a lot of TV shows and starting to work a lot and as a guest actor and things. And I, I had a teacher that would always work with me and I kind of liked that better, you know. Every I which way like but loose <laughs> you Steve, turn me. Steven's dad's which in way the songwriting hall of fame, so he wrote a couple of good songs. <laughs> yeah, I actually inducted him. Well, I gave the speech. Uh, Wait, let's hear it. Did he... <laughs> Song Dad wrote theme song theme song for Murphy Brown. Well, that'll get you into the Hall of Fame alone. Spencer for hire, too. Yeah, he, wrote um, the fans, he wrote the theme to Growing Pains. Too. Oh, that. I thought classic. Alan Thick said he did that. <laughs> my dad wrote it. Alan wrote a lot of themes before, but they hired my oh, dad. Oh, is that why your dad poisoned him three years ago? <laughs> <laughs> Zoe's Back very Alan, suspicious. Alan's a great was a great man, and he was a really nice. To, you know, he was a great friend of my family, and, and I'm still good friends with Robin, his son, and uh, Robin and my brother actually went to uh, went to school together at one of those fancy private schools. So when did when your dad started hitting it big? Did you guys move to Malibu or the West Side? Where'd you go? Yeah, I mean, my dad, you know, he wrote the songs, so he was kind of in the background. You know, he was he wrote through the years. Kenny Rogers, he wrote for. You know, he wrote through the years. Did you say? Yeah, yeah. huge. Oh, hits. I love that goddamn song. Yeah, my dad's the king of the ballads. He's still doing it for all the divas. You know, the Barbaras and the Celine Dion's and. He wrote I Cross My Heart, which was in play at a thousand weddings a year. Yeah, was that George Strait? George Strait, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my dad's still going. He's 71. We, we, nice. we've, had a, you know, we've had a few uh, big tragedies as I've gotten older. I lost my little brother uh, a few years ago, and he was just a monster songwriter in Nashville. He wrote all Blake Shelton's. Oh, wow. A lot of his number ones. And Kenny Chesney, Save It for a Rainy Day. And Andrew was... 40 years old, about to lapse my dad a few times, I think. Um, he would have definitely been in that Hall of Fame. But he, uh, yeah, he passed away uh, and uh, kind of changed my life. And then um, I moved, I actually moved to, uh, I bought a ranch in Tennessee where my brother lived. And um, I, uh, that's where I am right now. And uh, I finally got to move into it during this interesting period in our world and uh i was kind of going crazy in la not being able to work not being able to right so now i'm uh now i'm out here in god's country which is a little weird because uh i'm seeing all these strange creatures that i hadn't seen before like armadillos and <laughs> weird things that it's like it's, i'm like a city boy in the country well you know it's interesting yeah. la is uh and brian's got a question i'll get to it in a second but the thing about being locked down in L.A., L.A. is a place where you're supposed to do stuff. You know, right. people come here to start their careers or their ambitions or whatever it is. So when you're locked down in L.A., it's kind of like being on an amusement park when the roller coaster stops and you're just <laughs> sitting on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, or you're in an amusement park and there's no rides. There's no rides. <laughs> But everyone else who's gone somewhere or gone to the country or whatever, that just feels like good living. Like just feels like a quiet life, I, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, look, I love L.A. I have a love hate. I love coming to L.A. after a long period of being on the road working or, you know, I love uh, I love it. And that's where it was my city, where I'm from, um, you know, but I uh, I've never quite felt the way I felt in the last few months there. Uh, Brian, I just, sorry, I just, go ahead. Just felt, it felt uncomfortable, and I just didn't like the vibes, the energy, the city. That just needed a break. So I'm never really in LA for seven months straight, just sitting. Anyway, I'm usually there for two months, three months, leave. You know, and I like it like that. But you know, I just hope we uh, we all get a vaccine soon, and we're all healthy, and we all uh, can get back to being in the world again and have some mm. positivity going, maybe. Brian, here. Got a, a question. question about the new movie, Stephen. Um, oh, I've been a fan of yours ever since Backbeat. I loved your Stu Sutcliffe. I'm a big fan of that movie, and uh, I've been a fan of yours ever since then. And I wanted to know that I, I haven't seen, I, I confess, I have not seen every one of your movies, but I thought uh, you as um, Cash Boykins was outstanding. Well, the best performance I've seen of yours. I really, really liked it a lot. I'm wondering what 
drew you to the character? Because not only is he unlikable, he starts off as a little two-dimensional, but then by the end of the movie, he, he's a very complicated character, still an a-hole, but a pretty complicated character. I'm wondering how much you discussed the character. You said you know the writer. How much you discussed the character, how much you developed it, things like that. I'm curious. You know, it's weird. I just kind of, I guess as an actor, you look at, the overall piece when you read a script. And when I read this script, I was really moved by the jet story, my son's story in the movie, mm -hmm. you know, the, being a, a sibling to uh, being an older brother to a sibling with special needs sibling, you know, with William syndrome. Right, right. What does that do to, so, you know, I was moved uh, the, the, my ex's role, the Elizabeth Reeser part. I was moved by all this stuff. I fucking hated Cash Boykins, you know? And, uh, he's not a likable guy. He's entertaining, but he's not, you know. No, you know, but then again, you know, would I want to, you know, be best friends with Floyd May Mayweather? I, I don't know if I would have too much to get along. You know, he's, he's a brilliant fighter. He's, you know, all these lightweight champions, whether it's MMA, whether you know, I kind of studied a lot of them. The antithesis of this guy to me, as far as look and feel, felt like Conor McGregor. You know, when we made the film, it was before Connor lost to Khabib, who's just monstrous, incredible fighter all around. But Connor has a swagger and a and a kind of a an electric kind of um, stigma. He has a charisma. He has a charisma. He has a charisma, but then he also brings that charisma and he has raw talent in the ring, you know, to be able to do what he did to a friend of mine, Cowboy Cerrone, who's one of the toughest dudes I've ever met, uh, to be able to take him out of his game and 10 seconds uh, and end it. You know, I don't know. A lot comes with experience a lot. I don't know what it is. What I tried to do is emulate, take a piece from a lot of different people and, and, and focus. I studied Connor a lot. I studied the way he fought, his kind of striking kind of speed and his kind of, uh... but to go back to your question, I, you know, a great character is a great character. He can, he can be unlikable, you know? And I thought about it after I read it, I thought, geez, you know, what about, when Bob De Niro went and did Raging Bull and played Jake LaMotta, you know, was that a, a fun part to play every day? Probably not, you know, was Cash, uh, you know, was I uncomfortable playing him at times? Sure, you know, I had to go, but I believe in commitment and if whatever role you're doing, I believe in committing 100%. So I was down to offend whoever was gonna get offended. I didn't care. I was gonna read David McKenna's script as he wrote it. Cause the only way to really tell this story without it just becoming a typical happy ending kind of vanilla coded, uh, you know, cash becomes great dad at the end out of nowhere, which is, you know, a lot of 90% out of a hundred, what it would have become, you know, we wanted to go hard with it. And this is a guy that will never change. Maybe he'll come around and be a little softer. And I tried to bring some human emotion to him by the end without giving too much away there, but overall it was a great piece. I wanted to act in it. I wanted to be involved. You know, it's really rare these days to read great scripts. And, and I thought it also was moving even without the UFC element. Then you put this over the top kind of um, monstrous character in the front as Cash. And I was just kind of like, wow, it's a, it's a family drama set against the backdrop of MMA and the UFC. And I, he's got know, a little bit of great Santini in him, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the, 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 dick, you the, know, the family the dictator. Fighter. Yeah. The um, by the way, so um, Conor McGregor took out Cowboy Cerrone with his shoulder, which is a un was very actually. I think it was the first that first knee. I think broke. You know, knocked the fucking, and then he came right in with those two shoulders. He was pumps. throwing him. Rarely does one take out an opponent with a shrug. <laughs> but it, this worked. Wow. I, you've never seen it in UFC. He was and, and Cowboy didn't seem to know what to make of it, but he literally shouldered him when they were that, in in and, tight. And Cowboy, I've known for now about we. I made a movie called Felon years ago. Um, really cool movie with Sam Shepard and Val Kilmer. And Cowboy worked on that in Mexico. And and he's ever since then. I was a friend of his, and I watched him fight a few times in the arena and man this guy could just take anything he's so i was very excited about this chance he got because i literally thought he was going to take connor's head off and you know it's just such a it's such an adrenaline sport it's such a freak thing it can be over in two seconds it's a, it's a yeah that was a that was a quick that was a quick one and then khabib who's the baddest man on the planet yeah. kind of he kind of reminds me of a oh we can we can show you the the clip he's 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 
mashing him with his left shoulder in the, the, in the bridge of the nose. Um, the the thing about, you know, it's funny. A lot of these guys kind of remind me, uh, Khabib is like, uh, and a lot of these guys are that this way. They're like reptiles in that they don't have a medium speed. So Khabib is either beating the shit out of somebody in the ring or going over the fence and trying to beat the shit out of their yeah. posse in the audience, yeah. or he's weeping openly about his father in the ring. <laughs> and, he doesn't. And he and, did, and quitting. He doesn't have it. So, you know, it's I like. Abu Dhabi. That was in Abu Dhabi because my trainer, Chris Connolly, had the fight, the undercard before. That. Anyway. I was going to say, so reptiles are like, he's, he's like a reptile. A lot of these guys are that way. Like in that when you see a python, the python's just sitting there. It's like it's not doing anything. And then it's on top of you killing you. It right. doesn't really have a medium. They don't have a medium speed. It's kind of, it's, it's an interesting wiring, which is you can't really have a medium speed. If you're going to get in the octagon, you have to be completely cool cucumber, you know, uh, out of body, you know, I'm just walking into this octagon in front of 18,000 people with a guy who's a trained assassin is going to kill me. I can't be overwhelmed by that. A real low heart rate. And then when the bell rings, I go into full Python pounce mode. But there's yeah. not a lot of in-between with any of these guys. No. And you feel it when you meet him. I mean, you know, Cowboy is, uh, I wouldn't say as flashy as a Conor McGregor. I don't know Conor, but Cowboy's a great guy. And he's a real cowboy, you know, in New Mexico. And he kind of races motorcycles and invited me to play paint pellets, uh, paint gun <laughs> war with him, which I'm That's sure was awesome. an extreme paint pellet war. And I was a little frightened because I was shooting at the time and I didn't want to like, you know, an agitator. Well, yeah. especially when he runs out of paintballs and starts coming at you with his hands, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, there is a, there is a thing called acting and that's what I do. But, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for these guys, but you know, Connor, I mean, when, when cowboy walks into a bar or something, we're just going to watch a football game or something. And this guy is just a tough, Dude, and you can feel it. You can feel that he's had is you know, I think he has the record for the most UFC fights of a fighter that's still going. Um he holds some record for something. But go. you know, he was originally in a battle and we had a great scene and it's a bummer, but it was cut out, which kind of sucks. But uh at the same time it was cut out not because it wasn't a good scene. I saw the scene, it was funny as hell. It just uh, didn't quite work in the cut because mo uh, emotionally we, we go with uh, Cash's ex and Jet's mom at that point in the restaurant. But it was a funny scene where he played an autograph guy and he was, it was like role reversals. He came up to me and asked me for, he was geeking out on me and, and I basically wrote something rude in the autograph and he's like, what the fuck, Cash? You know, and I, it was like kind of a funny little but anyway, uh, I love the guy. I mean, and they've been really sweet to me and helped me over the years on things. Judgment Night. Now, the reason I bring up Judgment Night is because I worked on Judgment Night. You did? I was a stand-in for, <laughs> for one of the bad guys. <laughs> you never told me that when I came and did your show before. Uh, it's the kind of thing one doesn't reveal on the first date, you know? Remember, I came to the studio with you last time. I did like herpes. I didn't say anything about Judgment Night. I don't think so, but that's crazy. So you were a stand-in for like Everlast or one of the, or Dennis Leary or somebody? No, I was the third or fourth bad guy with the long hair. I can't remember the guy's, oh. the guy's name. And... I was 19, and that's like the movie that had the big soundtrack. That's what it was. Yes. Called. That's right. It was the rock and rap soundtrack, right? Wasn't that yeah, the big it had thing? This kind of uh, big cult following because of that. You know, the movie wasn't bad either. But no, it was, it was I enjoy awesome. that movie. But the, the question, what, what was going on in the set is the good guys, the actors, and the bad guys, the actors started their own rivalry. Like it, it actually, the the art became life. Why the, is your I, technique? Like, I wanted to hang out with the bad guys because it was like you know Dennis Leary and Everlast. I knew from L.A. and you know House of Pain was was you know big band that I grew up to. And in L.A., you know I knew I knew Everlast for a long time. But then it became this like I'm like guys, we don't. Like, I was 19, but I guess I knew. A little too much then, but I was kind of like, we don't have to do this, guys. It's not really brain surgery, this picture. We're just, 
a bunch of guys in a Winnebago and you're chasing us. We don't really have to get method on this, you know? When I was doing Public Enemies, Michael Mann's movie, in that one, we took it a little more seriously. The good guys and, and Johnny and the Dillinger gang would hang and we'd live over here. And the cops and Christian Bale and all those kids would live on the other side, you know? But I don't know, on Judgment Night, but they were serious about it. I really wanted to hang with the bad guys too because they were hitting that China club every night. And that was the hot spot back then. Michael, Michael D. Lorenzo. Uh, oh, does that sound yes. weird? Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Michael yeah, D. Lorenzo. That's the guy. The actor? Uh, I Evidently, because I was standing in for him. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you if you could. Are you from Chicago? Hmm? Are you from Chicago? No, I'm from L.A. And oh. I had a buddy who was the second A.D., Robbie Levine, on that movie. Come on out. And you guys shot in Chicago, and then when you're done shooting in Chicago, you're coming to shoot in L.A., and he said, I can get you a job as a stand-in. And I was like, that's the best-sounding job I've ever heard of. Yes. yes. You know where everyone would know Michael DiLorenzo from? If not him, his character for sure. He was Private William Santiago in uh, Free Good Men. Oh, that's wow. right. The, the, the private who dies and kicks yeah. off the plot of the movie. Yeah, I know who I know who I know who Michael is. Yeah, he had obviously short hair in that movie, yeah. but in our movie, our movie. <laughs> our, okay. <laughs> our film. Our film, uh, he had long hair, so it's like a completely different. That was one of the things. I had short hair, and he had this long shoulder-length hair, and I remember the lighting director probably, they didn't put some weird wig on you because normally they'll do that just for the lighting and stuff they'll put some like moppy wig on you on the stand-in that doesn't you know that doesn't really resemble the locks of the actor. i was just uh yeah there oh, he yeah. is i remember oh, oh, there yeah. he oh, is peter green where have you been i'll tell oh, yeah, you peter. um you want a fun peter watch peter. you could do a lot worse than judgment night it's a it's a fun it's a fun movie to watch all right, Stephen, let me give you a, a plug here. Embattled's the name of the movie. It's uh, very good, and it's available uh, tomorrow in select theaters and uh, video on demand as well. Uh, any Twitter or websites or anything you want to give a shout-out to? Um, I don't really do the old social media. But, good for uh, you. But I think, but I think Embattled, uh, I think it's like IFC Embattled, but I could get one of the PR people to call your people, Adam, and tell you that because I'm an idiot and I don't know that. I'm just as idiotic. <laughs> All right. Well, when you come back to L.A., come see us in, in the studio. I'd love to, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks man. Thanks for everything. Stephen yeah. Dorff, everybody. Yeah, yeah, Thanks, you guys. All right. Let me hit uh, Madison Reed here. Madison Reed, mister. So uh, Madison Reed makes beautiful Hair coloring for women. Lynette loves this stuff. Gina uses it on occasion as well. And they said, uh, well, what about the fellas? And so they said, well, how about we make Madison Reed Mister? It's a great blending, natural looking color for your hair and beard. You can see the before and after shots. Uh, they look fantastic. No shoe polish look here. Maybe you just want a little more pepper and a little less salt. Well, Madison Reed Mister makes it easy to find the color, and you can match it on their website. It's quick and easy. Just apply the color gel, and then the activator. Let it sit for 10 minutes. Rinse and shampoo. Plus, uh, they'll deliver it right to your door. It is Madison Reed Mister, right, Dawson? Go to MadisonReedMister.com. That's M-A-D-I-S-O-N-R-E-E-D-M-R.com. And use code ADAM10 for 10% off, plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code ADAM10. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back with the news right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. All those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Need news with Gina Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Well, move over. John Legend and Idris Elba and Blake Shelton and Dwayne Johnson. We have a new sexiest man alive, according to People magazine. Congratulations to Michael B. Jordan. Mm. He is now People's sexiest man alive. Uh, he, it's seven years ago, People magazine ta uh, tapped him as the one to watch in that year's sexiest man alive issue. And they correctly predicted this moment. 
they predicted it. They also picked it. Uh, and the third straight year for a black man to be chosen. And uh, again, we've got John Legend, Idris Elba, Blake Shelton, Dwayne Johnson. And now we have Michael B. Jordan. Speaking mm. of boxers. John Legend is attractive, but I don't know if I have him in the sexiest man alive. He got a lot of shit for that. He he he'll be the first one to tell you, according to his Instagram, that he was trolled pretty hard for for having that honor bestowed upon him. So we got three years running with a black man, right? Mm -hmm, yep. So now it's going to be weird if you do Conan O'Brien next year, right? Like <laughs> You'll get the bends. Weird on a number of levels. <laughs> yes, it would. But it's, there's kind of an element of like when you have a black secretary of labor or something and then they have to be replaced. You, now you kind of have to find another black secretary of labor. Right. So uh, this like, is it. You, know. mm. you got to pivot to some other race or, you know, mm -hmm. something. Well, now more than ever, my uh, magazine Honky Style. I think uh, I think now it's about time we get going with that shit. All right, so even uh, Dorf could grace the first uh, issue. That's right, sexiest that's man alive. He'd be great. Don't you wish your dad wrote a shitload of hit songs? Oh my god, oh, I, one I? hit song would be amazing. That's yeah, what you're for the rest of your goddamn life. We all know all the '80s and '90s sitcoms, and they're all good and delightful. But Growing Pains, top three, possibly number one, best theme song. Every which way but loose <laughs> was his first big. That's the one where Clint Eastwood had the orangutan who punched yeah, people. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. And what Left was the Kenny Rogers song? That's right. What's that? What was the Kenny Rogers song? Oh, Through Islands the Years? The oh, oh, Through the Years. Yeah, that's right. yeah. yeah. I love that song. Love it's that song. a good song. one. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're trying to party in uh, New Orleans for Carnival Pass, because you're probably going to get booted all right off of Bourbon Street. No parades of any kind will be permitted for the oh. 2021 carnival season. That's the official website. The mayor wrote on Facebook that with COVID spreading, we need to modify carnival. Now, they're not saying it's canceled. They're just saying there's no parades. So mm -hmm. I can't take one more virtual event at, at yeah. when it comes to like Couldn't Halloween just... and couldn't they have people at the beginning kind of staggering people like you go get, you know, 10 feet down the road, then you Spoken go. Spoken like somebody who's never been to Carnival. <laughs> I have not. Never but, been to uh, but I anyway, haven't either, but. To substitute you, think, for what would be a great event. Could they Yeah, not? but they're already staggering because they're shit faced. Staggering. There's no yeah. way to permit to, to get those people to stand six feet away from each other. They do the, don't they do the, um, the annual greasing of the pole? the night before so people don't try to climb the pole in in oh, the middle of the french I quarter i, I mean you they these people are treated like toddler zombies they're already a mess and wasted and trying to climb everything and take all their clothes off so i don't know how they're going to enforce this i've been there uh, during mardi gras i guess we shot man show bits there but uh yeah Tommy it's, Lasorda. it's bedlam over there it's sodom and gomorrah yeah <laughs> toughest sodom job and Lasorda. T toughest job in the world is cameraman on Bourbon Street during Mardi Gras because Jimmy and I would have to walk and he'd have to film us, but he'd have to walk backwards. Yeah. Imagine right. walking backwards down yeah. Bourbon Street in the height of, of the humanity. He always had his left hand would be on the camera and his right hand was feeling behind was him like the whole, the whole the time. Void. A lot of times when that's going to be a big part of your role, you have like an assistant that's literally there just to hold your back and to walk back backwards with you. Yeah, there was probably you didn't get one of those. Well, he probably did get somebody, but there's such a throng of humanity that uh, there's not enough assistance in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that. I remember going out and filming. And I remember this one, too, because it always used to drive me nuts inevitably the camera would run out of batteries and you'd have to stop. And then someone would go, where are the backup batteries? And someone would go, it's in the van. And then you'd go, where's the van? I go, it's on the other side of town. And then I would always be like, we know the batteries are going to wear out. Why don't we have the batteries with us? This is why people hated working with me, but it was always, we got them. They're in the van. We just got to go get them. It's like, but it's a far, it's a long ways away. But, uh, yeah, those kinds of jobs where something happens repeatedly, you know it's going to happen, right. but it doesn't – people, there's a lot of that in life where it's like this is going to happen. You should be prepared for this happening because it's your job and it always happens. All right. Sorry, mm -hmm. Gina. What else? Well, let's stay with the, uh, with the uh, fun and possibly tacky events. 
your favorite Adam Carolla, John Waters, he, you know, you you love hairspray. You love polyester. You Uh, love, uh, you know, um, shit. Now they all escape me. Thank you. But this year you get a very special treat. Oh, how about Cereal Mom? Pecker. Oh, I forgot about that. Crybaby. Crybaby. Oh, (laughs) he's such a hack. God, we have to respect him because he's kitschy. Well, you might have to tolerate him if you're planning on watching the Pornhub Awards. Oh he has signed on as a presenter for the adult film Honor, which is going virtual, of course, this year. Uh, he tells the New York Post, good filth on demand is what we all need to stay home and be sexually safe and socially distant in this obscene pandemic. Giving a Pornhub Award seems like a civic duty to me. So he'll yeah, be there it and, sounds uh, like twenty two hundred bucks in a Southwest <laughs> round trip ticket. That's what it sounds like to me. Ugh, that guy. So it, it, you've never interviewed him, right? I think I have. And I mean, didn't you? Wasn't he just delightful as a person, or no? He seems so fun. I have. You, you know, okay. So you all know, you all know that Ellen would dri- has driven me insane for fifteen years, right? Yes. Yes. Because I cannot stand that when someone puts something forward and I always hate it's why I was never like, you know, it's why I never like Marilyn Manson or like I, all those bands that are like on this whole thing over sure. here. But there's really no there's not a lot of ability, you know, Rob Zombie or something. It's like not a lot of ability with a lot of mm-hmm. sizzle, not a lot of steak. Um, I like everything. I like all the work to speak for itself and John Waters movies are fucking embarrassingly, insultingly bad, but he gets a free pass because he's this guy that he invented, but really he's just a fucking nerd from high school that did did his little penciled in mustache and his seersucker suits and stuff. And he's created this whole persona, which None of the great musicians and or none of the great directors or writers, they don't have that persona because their persona is their work. You know what I mean? Like their fair. their work speaks for itself. Yeah, he's he's a, he, if he put on fucking sweatpants and a members only <laughs> jacket and went to fucking supercuts, we wouldn't know his name. That's what I'm saying. Thus, okay. he's a hack. And his movies but, are fucking insultingly bad. They're not funny. I mean, he tries to do comedy. To- do, no. you, do, you, do, do you think he hides behind the fact that they're supposed to be insultingly bad? Well, okay. It's a bit of a cheat. I hope he doesn't open a restaurant. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, how about this experiment? Write a good movie. How about that? Maybe try yeah, that. Yeah, then we'll compare. A really good example of, uh, anti-example, sorry, of what Adam's talking about is David Lynch, who you know made a career off of doing just weird, surreal stuff. People had trouble following, not mainstream. Blah, he, was, he was strange, blah, blah. And then a few years ago, Adam, I don't know if you heard this movie or seen it, or Gina, he made a movie called The Straight Story. Just a beautiful, brilliant little movie. Not weird at all. It's about a fucking old man, Richard Farnsworth, who rides from like Nebraska to Wyoming on his train. Tractor to oh, see yeah. his like, dying I brother. That one. Farnsworth is nominated for an Oscar. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. And it's like, yeah, he has the goods. He can make these weird artsy movies, avant-garde. That's on him. Do what you do. But he can just nail a, a perfect, beautiful, straight, straightforward, no pun intended, movie. Yeah, I feel the transcendental meditation. Hey, I feel that way about musicians or whomever or painters or whatever. Do something crazy, weird, and wacky and then do something really brilliant like a compulsory kind of a thing and then you know like do crazy interpretive dance and then do some killer ballet or jazz or whatever and then i'll i'll be impressed straight story is great anyone who wants to watch it you'll love it it's a good movie and he is in one of my favorite Simpsons episodes with one of my favorite lines. Remember when John Waters is, is oh, trying yeah. to Gina, get Gina, I'm going to relieve you. You don't have to like John Waters just because no, you're I, a, a, you, a. But you like the Simpsons, right? But I'm saying just because you're a hero to the gay community, does, you can still not like John Waters. He's horrible at his job. When did I say I like John Waters? I mean, I do like John Waters. That's what, what do you mean? I'm, I'm looking at your face. You don't have to say it. It's one of my favorite Simpsons lines when when uh, he can't tell if that character's gay. And Homer goes, I, I like my beer cold, my TV loud, and my homosexuals flaming. <laughs> Don't get that drop. So let's go to the other side of the spectrum. Let's talk Mm. about Quentin Tarantino. So he has some new works coming out, but they're not movies. They're books. 
One, very interesting. So this is according to the AP. He has a two book deal with Harper, beginning with a novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And that's scheduled for next summer. So the book will come out first as this mass market paperback, like the old pulp novel, you know, books that he loves and will offer, quote, a fresh, playful and shocking departure from the film. And then his next book, which also I imagine is on brand for Tarantino, nonfiction, Cinema Speculation, which Harper is calling a deep dive into the movies of the 1970s oh, that God. draws in part on the uh, director's every movie he makes is a, Every movie he makes is a deep dive into the movies of the 1970s. <laughs> for the, and I don't know if you know this name, but draws on his admiration for the late New York critic, uh, New Yorker critic, Pauline Kael. Pauline Kael. And that, I, I don't know if you saw, um, I'm thinking of ending things, right, Brian? No, actually. Oh, no, no. oh! Please see and give well, it. Wait, wait, so many wait, times wait. I see something and I'm going to text you in the middle of the night, but I feel like yes, it's weird. Yes, I saw it. it, was, it was oh, you didn't care about it. Okay. Mm. Anyway, the, she she makes an appearance in that. <laughs> I and, want Tarantino uh, to make movies, man. He's that making books. I know, well, but I don't like reading. I like watching. Mm-mm. So as a one-time uh, Tarantino super fan, like owned the, 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 the books about Tarantino, the quickie books, the whatever, um, he, I'll quote him and say that he, uh, he said, if I was ever like a hardcore writer, like if I ever wanted to be a writer, I wouldn't write scripts. I'd write novels. Mm-hmm. So Tarantino's had this in his head for a long time. Uh, what, how this manifests itself, who knows? But he's always been like, yeah, if I was a writer, writer, I'd just write novels. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker. I uh, love that guy's films. And, you know, he's, what's he, two, three years in between films? Typically. Yeah. I think I like Django to, and the other one came out pretty quickly. Like but speed yeah, that up. Yeah. All right, Isn't Gina. He's threatening to wrap. Yeah. Sorry, let's do one more. All right. Well, let's stay on. Uh, nope, nope. Because we had um, because we had Stephen Dorff, we're talking about fights and big tough guys. Let's look at Alexei Novikov. He is now the world's strongest man. That competition was held over the weekend. And during the competition, Alexei Novikov from Ukraine set a world record with a 1,185 pound partial deadlift. And we have a picture of that. The guy oh is 24, Jesus. 24 Jesus. years old. And the record broke, uh, had stood from way back in 1983. And you want to talk about psyching yourself up for something? During an interview after the lift, he explained, this is how he pumps himself up. You think he's going to go super aggro and like crush a beer can against his head? This is how he pumps himself up. He says, when I walk in, I think, hmm, it's not heavy. That's no problem. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think that'd work for us. It's 1,000, <laughs> how many? 1,080? 1,185 pounds. Wow. He is. What makes it a partial deadlift? Yeah, he looks like he's got it straight on up. Yeah. That looks like a straight on straight on deadlift, man. And there were other competitions. It was so fun to watch. Um, I didn't pull it just because I didn't know how much time we'd have, but they're just giant boulders you have to pick up and put on top of this peg. And then you go to the next one, you put on top of this peg. And it looks, I mean, it, 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 it makes my back hurt to watch it. Yeah, they do. That's the fun thing about the strongman competitions. They're not just like pushing around weights. They're doing like Mm-mm. the keg toss right. and pulling a truck, pulling a truck. And the, yep. it's fun. Yeah. Pulling an airplane. Although I got to say the thing about like pulling the airplane with your teeth kind of guys, it seems really impressive, but I don't really have, I, I, I have no idea if it's hard or not. Lifting 1,200 pounds, that I'm aware of. You know what I mean? Right. And even the keg toss, I'm kind of aware of. But it seems like everyone who tries to pull something, they do it. Yeah, Everybody, it's on rollers. Yeah, it's on, it's on wheels. It's, it's, right. meant to be, it's meant to be pulled. Uh, all right, Gina, let's bring it home. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, last but not least, we got Geico. Do you own? Do you rent? Well, you probably do one or the other, right? You want to make uh, life a little easier? How about you bundle those policies? Bundle your homeowners and your renters with uh, insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because uh, you got enough to think about uh, these days. So. Let's go with Geico. Go to Geico.com, get a quote today, see just how much you could be saving when you bundle at Geico.com. All right, let's see. You can listen to Perez Hilton and me live on stereo today at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific? Yeah, a lot. Oh, okay, good. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
Uh, I want to thank Stephen Dorr for uh, zooming in. Interesting conversation with him and Battles, the name of his movie. It's available as we speak in theaters and video on demand. Uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, improv this weekend, November 20th, 21st. We're, 21st, we're doing live shows. We're doing stand-up. Gergo's going to be there on Saturday as well. And you can go to adamcarolla.com for all the live shows and events and everything you need. And until next time, Adam Carolla, for Stephen Dorff, Gina Grant, and Paul Bryan saying mahalo. <laughs>